This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer yourself, please visit www.librivox.org. Today's reading by Alex Foster, www.alexfoster.me.uk. A Journey to the Interior of the Earth by Jules Verne. Chapter Twenty Six, The Worst Peril of All. It must be confessed that hitherto things had not gone on so badly, and that I had small reason to complain. If our difficulties became no worse, we might hope to reach our end, and to what a height of scientific glory we should then attain! I had become quite a Liedenbrock in my reasonings. Seriously, I had. But would this state of things last in the strange place we had come to? Perhaps it might. For several days, steeper inclines, some even frightfully near to the perpendicular. Brought us deeper and deeper into the mass of the interior of the earth. Some days we advanced nearer to the centre by a league and a half, or nearly two leagues. These were perilous descents in which the skill and marvellous coolness of hands were invaluable to us. That unimpassioned Icelander devoted himself with incomprehensible deliberation, and thanks to him we crossed many a dangerous spot which we should never have cleared alone. But his habit of silence gained upon him day by day, and was infecting us. External objects produce decided effects upon the brain. A man shut up between four walls soon loses the power to associate words and ideas together. How many prisoners in solitary confinement become idiots, if not mad, for want of exercise for the thinking faculty? During the fortnight following our last conversation, no incident occurred worthy of being recorded. But I have good reason for remembering one very serious event which took place at this time, and of which I could scarcely now forget the smallest details. By the seventh of August, our successive descents had brought us to a depth of thirty leagues. That is, that for a space of thirty leagues there were over our heads solid beds of rock, ocean, continents, and towns. We must have been two hundred leagues from Iceland. On that day, the tunnel went down a gentle slope. I was ahead of the others. My uncle was carrying one of Rumkoff's lamps, and I the other. I was examining the beds of granite. Suddenly, turning round. I observed that I was alone. Well, well, I thought I have been going too fast, or Hans and my uncle have stopped on the way. Come, this won't do. I, I must join them. Fortunately, there is not much of an ascent. I retraced my steps. I walked for a quarter of an hour. I gazed into the darkness. I shouted. No reply. My voice was lost in the midst of the cavernous echoes which alone replied to my call. I began to feel uneasy. A shudder ran through me. Calmly, I said to myself, "I am sure to find my companions again. There are not two roads. I was too far ahead. I will return." For half an hour, I climbed up. I listened for a call, and in that dense atmosphere, a voice could reach very far. But there was a dreary silence in all that long gallery. I stopped. I could not believe that I was lost. I was only bewildered for a time, not lost. I was sure I should find my way again. Come, I repeated. Since there is but one road, and they are on it, I must find them again. I have but to ascend still. Unless indeed missing me and supposing me to be behind, they too should have gone back. But even in this case, I have only to make the greater haste. I shall find them, I am sure. I repeated those words in the fainter tones of a half-convinced man. Besides, to associate even such simple ideas with words and reason with them was a work of time. A doubt then seized upon me: Was I indeed in advance when we became separated? Yes, to be sure I was. Hans was after me, preceding my uncle. He had even stopped for a while to strap his baggage better over his shoulders. I could remember this little incident. It was at that very moment that I must have gone on. Besides, I thought, have I not a guarantee that I shall not lose my way? A clue in the labyrinth that cannot be broken, my faithful stream. I have but to trace it back, and I must come upon them. This conclusion revived my spirits, and I resolved to resume my march without loss of time. How I then blessed my uncle's foresight in preventing the hunter from stopping up the hole in the granite! This beneficent spring, after having satisfied our thirst on the road, would now be my guide among the windings of the terrestrial crust. Before starting afresh, I thought a wash would do me good. I stooped to bathe my face in the Hansbach. 
to my stupefaction and utter dismay, my feet trod only the rough, dry granite. The stream was no longer at my feet. End of chapter 26 Recorded in Nottingham, England on the 16th of January 2006 By Alex Foster www.alexfoster.me.uk